You may not have thought much of what happens when you talk on the phone with your friend. It seems pretty easy for the phone to record your voice, send it over the cellular network, and play it on your friend's phone. But that's not what actually happens. The problem with doing this is that sending audio at a high enough quality to actually recognize someone's voice takes a lot of data. At least 8,000 values every second. And maybe you don't think that's very much, but that's a lot for crammed cellular networks, especially for early cell services. So what does your phone do if it doesn't send the recorded audio? It compresses the audio into a much smaller set of values, and then your friend's phone recreates the audio from those values. Now the process of audio compression sounds like it might be quite complex, but with dot products and projections, we can develop a simple way to compress audio by at least 95%, which is the high end of MP3 compression rates. The first half of this video builds the final tools we need to do the audio compression, and in the second half, we actually compress the audio. I'll also introduce a few more words that are often introduced in linear algebra. Words like linear combination, span, and basis. It turns out projections in linear algebra solve a lot of different problems. Two main problems are the 3D to 2D problem, and the other is the best approximation problem. The 3D to 2D problem is a key part of 3D graphics figuring out which pixels on a 2D screen correspond to points in a 3D world, given the position and direction of the camera or viewer. But projections are often the solution to finding best approximations in a broad array of real-world problems. Here's a simple food example to illustrate. Suppose I want to adjust my peanut butter intake, which affects my daily protein, fat, and carbs. These nutrients form a vector, and changing the servings of peanut butter scales this vector, doubling the servings, doubles all values, cutting it in half reduces them proportionally, and so on. All possible changes lie on a single line. However, if my goal vector, which is the desired nutrient intake, doesn't fall on this line, I can't achieve the exact values just by adjusting peanut butter. So for what values of servings will the scaled peanut butter vector be closest to the head of the goal vector? Geometrically, we can find that special point when we drop a perpendicular from the head of the goal vector to the peanut butter line. This is referred to as the projection of our goal vector onto the peanut butter line. This looks like a problem we've seen before in a previous video when we were trying to find a way to measure the angle between two arbitrary vectors using the dot product. One of the steps in that problem was to scale the vector to point to the base of the perpendicular segment, and we found that scalar k by using the fact that the vector w in the diagram is orthogonal to r, so the dot product between these two must be zero, and we get this formula. You can see the derivation in a video in the description. So this best approximation problem, or projection problem, just became easy. We can use this formula with two dot products to calculate k, and that's the number of servings of peanut butter I change in my diet to get as close as I can to my goal. Well, that isn't very close, so what do I do? Well, I can change my diet with two foods to see if I can get closer. Let's say bread and peanut butter. Mathematically, I'm trying to get the goal vector by changing the servings of peanut butter and bread, but the servings of each are just different scalars of the vectors. So I want this expression to be as close as possible to the goal vector. Let's pause to introduce the idea of linear combinations. Notice that our expression on the left is a sum of scaled vectors. If we add another food to try to reach our goal, we would still be adding up scaled vectors. This operation of summing up scaled vectors is called a linear combination. The dot product that we learned about in previous videos is a linear combination of numbers, for example, real numbers. Since a linear combination of numbers is called a product, the dot product, mathematicians also define the linear combination of vectors as a product. It's a product of a matrix multiplied by a vector. We will go deeper into matrix multiplication in a subsequent video. Okay, back to the problem. With just peanut butter and bread, could we reach our goal exactly? That would mean we would have to solve this equation for k and j. If we rewrite the expression from the vectors into three equations, we have a system of equations. We can try to solve this system and find that there is no solution. So we can't get there exactly with just peanut butter and bread. Well, when we only had peanut butter, we solved our problem by looking at all of the diet changes I could make by changing just peanut butter servings, which ended up being a line and we found the closest point on the line to the head of the goal vector. Well, let's try the same thing. What are all of the diet changes I can make by changing the amount of bread and peanut butter I eat? I've set up this GeoGebra applet to run through a bunch of combinations of J and K and put a point at the resulting 
protein, fat, carb value. These points aren't falling on a line. They look like they're all over. But if we change our view, it starts to be clear. These points all lie in one plane that slices through three dimensions. A mathematician would say that the span of the peanut butter and bread vectors is a plane. The span of a set of vectors is a set of vectors produced by all possible linear combinations of the set. With one non-zero vector, the span is a line. With two non-zero vectors, the span could be a line or a plane. One reason we care about spans of vectors is exactly how we are using them here. We know these two vectors span a certain plane, and we can use that to help solve our best approximation problem. Okay, so now we need to find the point on the plane that is closest to the head of our goal vector. This is a harder problem than just dealing with a line. We can use similar geometry to set up an equation to solve with just two vectors and three elements in each vector, and it is doable. But this general problem turns up all of the time. How to find the combination, meaning finding the coefficients of a set of vectors and add them together to get closest to a goal vector. In other words, we need to find a linear combination of vectors to get closest to a given vector. The vectors on the left side that we use in our linear combination are often referred to as basis vectors. You can think of basis vectors in this context as the building blocks to make or approximate the goal vector. For example, how do we distribute money in different stocks to get a portfolio with certain characteristics? The values of each individual stocks would be our basis vectors, and our desired portfolio characteristics are our goal vector. If there is a linear combination of basis vectors to get the goal vector exactly, then this is equivalent to solving a system of equations. If the vectors can't be combined to get the goal vector exactly, then we're in this tricky best approximation situation where we're trying to find the vector in the span of the basis vectors that's closest to the head of the goal vector. We don't have the tools to solve this general problem right now when we can't get an exact match, but many of you may know this problem by a different name. This is a least squares regression problem, but from a very different perspective. If instead of two vectors of length three, we think of this as three points in a two-dimensional grid, the equation of the line that goes through the origin that is closest on average to these three points will get us the j and k we are looking for. If you're thinking that we don't need linear algebra here because we can just use regression, then you have it backwards. The computation to find coefficients j and k uses a formula developed with linear algebra based on vectors, which turns out to be much simpler than thinking about regression as a line or a plane or a hyperplane close to points. So what does all this have to do with audio compression? And why did I stop at a problem that seems too hard to solve? Well, finding the best approximation is generally difficult, but there's one case where it becomes much easier. When the vectors we work with, the basis vectors, are orthogonal. So why does orthogonality make things easier? Because when vectors are orthogonal, each one moves us in an independent direction. Let's look at an example. Suppose we have two orthogonal vectors, 0, 1, and a negative 2, 0, which we'll call up and over. To reach the goal vector 2, 3, we can easily determine that we need three up vectors and a negative 1 over vectors. This works because the up vector only affects vertical movement, while the over vector only affects horizontal movement. The up vector doesn't go over at all, and the over vector doesn't go up at all. Since they don't interfere with each other, we can solve for each coefficient independently by projecting the goal vector onto each basis vector. Now let's try this with non-orthogonal vectors, like 0, 1, and 1, 1. If we project into each vector to find the coefficients, it doesn't give us the goal vector. Since they do interfere with each other, meaning that each vector moves a little bit in the direction of the other one, this makes the calculation much harder because they have to account for the over with both coefficients, not just one. So how do we do all of this to compress audio? Well, sound is just varying levels of air pressure hitting the eardrum. Speakers are made to change the air pressure at precise values and at precise times. Well, digital audio can be saved as a list of evenly spaced values of the pressure intensity. This is basically what a .wav file is. Here are the values of a WAV file from the first part of me saying hello. It's only about the first 1 40th of a second and has 1200 evenly spaced values. This list of pressure intensities can be thought of as one vector or a packet of values. That's a lot of values to send for a fraction of a second. We would love to send much less information, but keep about the same audio quality. So how are we going to do that? Well, here's the strategy. We're going to create 60 orthogonal basis vectors that we can use to create this sound vector. 
we choose 60 specific orthogonal vectors that both your phone and your friend's phone already have programmed in. Instead of sending the entire sound vector, we only need to transmit the 60 coefficients that describe how to combine these basis vectors to recreate the sound. And if this method works, we're only sending 5% of the original data, drastically reducing the amount of information that needs to travel over already crowded networks. But we have two problems. What 60 vectors are we going to use? And how can we calculate the coefficients quickly enough to send them to your friend's phone so it doesn't lag? We can create the basis vectors using waves. Sound is a varying wave. And maybe if we have different frequencies of sine and cosine waves, we could get a good approximation. For example, we could create a vector of length 1200 that does one complete sine cycle, another one that does two complete sine cycles, another one that does three complete sine cycles, and goes up to 30 cycles. But are these sine waves orthogonal? Luckily they are, or are close enough that we'll assume that they are. We will create another 30 vectors with cosine waves at the same frequencies, and luckily these are all also orthogonal to each other and the sine vectors. Now we need to determine the scaling coefficient for each of these vectors using the formula we discussed at the beginning. But we can simplify this even more. The denominator of this expression is equivalent to the length of the basis vector squared. If we scale our basis vectors to all have length one, then all we need is the dot product between the sound vector and a wave vector to find the coefficient of that particular wave vector that we need to approximate the sound vector. Now remember from our previous videos, dot products aren't just used to find the angle between vectors, but are a measure of similarity. In essence, these coefficients are telling us how similar that sine or that cosine wave is to the original audio. We can see by the relative sizes of the dot products that some of these are more similar to the sound wave we're trying to match, while others are not. Conceptually, we can see that some of these values make sense. For example, the sine and cosine vectors that have three cycles have relatively large coefficients, which makes sense because we can see a pattern of three large peaks in this sound bite. So how close is our approximation? I have graphed the original data and the one recreated with the linear combination of the wave basis vectors. We can only see slight differences near the ends of the graphs, but it looks almost indistinguishable everywhere else. So it's not perfect, but you won't hear the difference. In practice, phones do something very close to this, but overlap segments to get better matches at the ends. If we overlap to fix the end, we could actually just use the sine waves and not the cosine waves. Our recreation is almost exactly the same, but they jump at the beginning. That cuts down on computation for each audio segment by half, but the overlap requires more segments, so we'd still end up around 95% compression rate. With the fast computing chips and phones, the coefficients of the basis wave vectors can be found almost instantaneously and reproduced on your friend's phone just as fast. I think the lag in phones is more about passing the coefficients through the network. This process of compression is very close to what is called the modified discrete cosine transform and is one of the most widely used audio compression methods, and it's the first of four parts in the MP3 compression. The general process of approximating goal vectors by building orthogonal basis vectors is done in a lot of contexts. JPEG image compression is done with the same general method with 8x8 grids of pixels and a set of orthogonal images. Any 8x8 pixel image can be made exactly by these 64 images, and the compression comes by dropping the basis image vectors with very small coefficients, which means they contribute very little to the image. And since the images are in a way orthogonal, computers can calculate the coefficients one basis image at a time while ignoring all the others. So in the end, the ideas that allowed us to find such a powerful compression tool were linear algebra ideas, thinking about a span of basis vectors, orthogonality, and projection. The actual computation, mainly dot products, was quite easy. The harder part was choosing and creating reasonable orthogonal basis vectors that could have a good chance of approximating small clips of sound waves. This same idea of finding a set of basis vectors to approximate complex data pops up everywhere in computing, from audio compression to image compression to machine learning. So next time you call a friend, just remember, your recorded voice isn't actually traveling through the air. It's just a set of coefficients found by dot products to combine with waves on the other end. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe and share our videos. Be sure to follow Math the World on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Thank you so much for your support.